Small Places, Large Issues, Chapter 16. I'm going to try and do my best to hold this. Sorry about that. Complexity and Change. Now that the Polynesian islands have been clad in concrete and transformed into hangar ships anchored in the Pacific Ocean when all of Asia is beginning to look like a polluted suburb, when cities of cardboard and sheet metal spread all over Africa, when civilian and military airplanes violate the untouched innocence of American Melanesian forests, even before they take away their virginity, what can be the so-called flight from reality entailed by traveling then result in other than confronting us with the most unfortunate aspects of our own history? Claude Levi Strauss. Some of the previous chapters have examined different forms of political organization, worldviews, and systems of economic production and distribution. It has been noted for decades that the ethnographic present that the tense conventionally used when anthropologists talk about different societies is increasingly more and more and more rapidly becoming a past tense. In Australia, 250 languages were spoken in the late 18th century. At the outset of the 21st century, there were about 30 still regularly spoken and, a, and few of them seemed that likely to survive for another generation in Australia. Virtually all inhabitants of the world live in states <clears throat> which define them as citizens, see chapter 18, and a growing majority of the world's population depends on general purpose, money, in their daily life. Nominally, well over half the world's adult population is literate. Urban anthropology changing continuity. One of the most visible aspects of so social and cultural change in the period since the Second World War has been urbanization. While less than 5% of Africa's t population lived in towns and cities, and then in 1900, about 45% did in 2015. And the numbers for Asia and Latin America are of comparable, I'm sorry, of, of a comparable order. For the first time in human history, a majority of the world's population is now urban. At the end of the Neopolonic Neo Wars, the proportion was about 3% worldwide. There are several related causes of urbanization, population growth in the countryside and transitions from subsistence agriculture to the production of cash crops led to a general land shortage and greater vulnerability simultaneously, new wage, new opportunities for wage work arise in and near the cities owing to industrialization and other forms of differentiation. World dwellers also lose their land and livelihood due to the development of roads, factories, and industrial farming. Many are driven to the comparative safety of cities by war and unrest also. Most urban dwellers in non-industrial countries, however, are usually classified as poor although their lot might not have been better if they had stayed in the countryside, the growth of urban slums has been spectacular in recent decades. The urban scholar and journalist Mike Davis describes a situation where the entire coastal area stretching from Benin City to, in Nigeria to Accra in Ghana could be designated a single continuous slum or informal settlement, where a similar development includes up to 50 million people along the coast from Rio de Janeiro to Sao Paulo, where African cities like Nuchot with an infrastructure adopted, adapted to fill re the requirements of 20,000 to 30,000 persons have swelled to 
into makeshift cities of 2 million and so forth. A series of early studies of urbanization in Africa has been in very influential, both theoretically and method methodologically. The group of researchers collectively known as the Manchester School undertook an ambitious exploration of urbanization in Southern Africa under the leadership of Godfrey Wilson and later Max Gluckman from the late 1930s to the 1960s. The development of the copper industry in northern Rhodesia, today Zambia, Zambia, led to a great need for labor from the early decades of the 20th century. The industry was concerned in a belt in the northeastern region known as the Copper Belt, and the miners often felt often had to travel far to get to work. In the mining towns, they lived in barracks not intended for family life. Unlike many Western, West African cities, such as Ibadan or Timbuktu, as well as older coastal East African cities like Mombasa and Zanzibar town, the towns in this part of the continent were founded on and populated very quickly. They had no traditional sector and no historical predecessors. There was also, there were, there was thus a sharp social and cultural discontinuity between the towns and the outlying countryside. The mine owners assumed that they could send the workers back to their villages in periods when their labor was not needed. They did not eventually come about. However, labor migration intended to be seasonal led to partial. I'm sorry. This book is hard to hold, guys. You've got to bear with me. Led to a popular depopulation of the rural areas and eventually the entire families lived more or less permanently in the mining towns. A permanent proletarianization of former farmer population had taken place. In the first anthropological study of urbanization in the Copper Belt, Godfrey Wilson introduces the term detribalization. In other words, he emphasizes the qualitative change in social integration entailed by urbanization. From being kinship-based subsistence producers, the workers become individual participants in the world economy. He writes describing this society as a community in which impersonal relations are all important where business law and religion make men dependent on millions of other men whom they have never met. A community articulated into races, nations, and classes in which the tribes are no longer almost worlds in themselves now take their place as small administrative units a world of writing, of specialized knowledge, and of elaborate technical skill. Wilson, 1941-42, quoted in Honors, 1980. Wilson also noted notes a change in the value orientation of the proletarianized Africans remarking that the Africans of Broken Hill are neither a cattle pit people nor a fishing people, but a dressed people in towns clothes become an object of investment, a kind of special purpose money, an expression of individualism through conspicuous, conspicuous consumption and an expression of an emulation of a European lifestyle. <clears throat> While Wilson in this early study, <clears throat> excuse me, concentrated on describing change, J. Clyde Mitchell later focused on the relationship between change and continuity. In the small monograph, The Kalaya, Kal Kalala Dance, 1956, the Kalala Dance was performed every Sunday afternoon by labor migrants belonging to the Bisa people in the town of Luanensha. 
They were dressed in modern clothes and the dance did not form part of their traditional cultural repertoire. However, the dance <clears throat> and songs were definitely markers of tribal group identity. Although the kin groups and tribal forms of organization did not have a significant practical role and the town's group identify was frequently over communicated. That is, it was given special emphasis in context of interaction. Moreover, the contrast with other groups became more visible here than it had been in the countryside. In towns, people categorized each other according to their place of origin, a criterion which had only rarely been relevant and many of the new forms of association made possible by the towns by the town, peer groups, clubs, etc., were based on ethnic membership. Mitchell notes significantly sorry, that the notion of tribe and group membership continues to be important after urbanization, but that it's significant changes in response to shifts in the overall social organization. In this way, he and other members of the group foreshadow later developments in the study of ethnic symbolism. See chapter 17. The body of work has nonetheless been criticized for taking a too facile view of social change. Seeing the transition from village life to city life is an overly linear process, Ferguson, 1999. Many later studies of urbanization and change have taken their cue from the studies carried out by the Manchester School in a study of political organization among Hawashu in the Yoruba city of Ibadan. Abner Cohen, 1969 shows how cultural symbols and traditional principles of social organization change in the meaning, but remain important when they are moved from a traditional to a modern context. To mention a couple of further examples, David Law, 1985, has shown how traditional spirit mediums and old myths gain new, a new significance during the civil war in Zimbabwe and provided legitimacy entirely new political institutions, notably the guerrilla movement, whereas Richard Nils Wilson has provided a similar kind of analysis of political mobilization in ma marginal Indian populated Highland Guatemala, where he shows that the pol that local political entrepreneurs may inno innovatively draw on both local and foreign symbols and sources of legitimacy in their bid to mobilize the local population in the initially alien modern political sphere. In situations of change, there are certain aspects of culture and social organization which alter and certain aspects which do not. What changes and what does not is an empirical question. There is no general answer to, to it. What is clear, however, is that change does not stop. In a restudy of the Copper Belt carried out in the 1990s, James Ferguson describes a modernization process which has been thwarted, rerouted, and... I'm sorry. Let me try and do it this way. <sighs> rerouted and... In the opinion of many, stalled, Ferguson's elderly informants speak no nostalgically about a time when they had owned a fine tuxedo or attended a concert by the ink spots or eaten T-bone steak at a restaurant. The image that comes across is not so much one of ex expectations of modernity as the book's title signals, but mem memories of modernity a belief in process in progress which evaporated at some point along the route. The Zambian economy, Ferguson states, 
has been disconnected and excluded from the mainstream of global economy. It was a part of an incipient global modernity at the time of the initial Copper Belt studies, but no longer is a formally overheated place characterized by rapid change and economic growth has subsequently cooled down. Conceptualizing complexity, urban anthropology in Southern Africa raised methodological issues which became increasingly increasingly relevant in the 1960s onwards. As fewer anthropologists now studied relatively isolated villages or local communities, in a city it is a it is practically impossible for a researcher to develop an overview of, an, of the entire social universe. Many encounters with informants are brief and there are thousands of members of the society under, stu under study whom one has no chance of ever meeting. Obviously, it is something quite different to study social relations in Lumentia or on Manhattan than it is to spend a year in a village in Kirwinia. Many contemporary anthropological studies are moreover multi-sided, Marcus 1998, to gain a full picture of the life worlds of one's transitional informants, one has to do field work in two or several locations. In order to solve some of the methodological problems raised in urban anthropology, the Manchester School developed a rigorous methodology to study social networks. They also proposed the extended case study as an alternative to the traditional holistic style of inquiry. A case study would characteristically focus on an important public event drawing conclusions about the wider social and cultural context on the basis of intensive exploration and the in, and interpretation of that event and its wider ramifications. The Kalala Dance was a typical case study along such lines. In urban anthropology and more generally anthropology in modern societies, it is impossible to find out about everybody Due to, okay, it's going to, I'll come back to this so you can read this. Due to this complexity and size of the societies concerned in a word, <clears throat> their scale. Modern societies are large and highly differentiated. There are several ways of approaching this problem. One possible solution is the case study. Another related approach consists of focusing on a strictly delineated topic such as the downward mobility of parts of the Northern American middle class. In the 1980s, Newman, 1988, or transition, transnational adoption in Norway, Hal, 2007, one may also choose to concentrate on a restricted topic and a delineated physical field, as in Marianne Golstad's pioneering monograph on gender, material, culture, and everyday life in a suburb of Bergen, or Philip Bourgeois's study of crack dealers in New York. A third strategy could be to single out a small group in a complex society, for example, gypsies in Britain, or Iranian women in the Netherlands and California. Usually such studies have to give a great deal of attention to the relationship between the, the group and greater society and may thereby shed light on a wider tech context in the same way as an extended case study does. A study combining several of these approaches is David William Cohen's and E.S. Etino Odihimba's monograph on Siaya. Siaya is an area in western Kenya largely populated by Luo speakers that is a classic labor power reservoir in the capitalist sector of the Kenyan economy.
About 475,000 people lived in the re region at the time of fieldwork. Another 134,000 were born there but lived elsewhere, usually as migrant workers. Many households in Sia are dependent on economic contributions from family members who work in Nairobi and elsewhere. The latter are in return dependent on food supplies from home. Daily life in Sia is thus closely intertwined with the lives of migrants and the workings of large-scale Kenyan society. And at the, I'm sorry, Daily Life of CI, to do contributions from the family, I'm sorry, later are <clears throat> dependent on food supplies from home. Daily Life in CI is thus closely intertwined with the lives of migrants and the workings of large-scale Kenyan society. And at further removed the global economy. The example of CI thus shows how local life is interconnected with large-scale social and cultural processes. First, labor migration has led to significant social and cultural changes locally. Second, the national education system, the increasing scale of society, and the new occupational opportunities have created a luo middle class and new forms of internal social differentiation. Third, urban luaus developed their own political organizations in Nairobi decades ago. And there are parts of Nairobi and certainly ethnic networks in Nairobi, which may be analytically included in Lua land. Fourth, as part of a national compromise between the largest ethnic groups of the country, Kenyan authorities reserved an area in the Rift Valley, away from the traditional tribal area of the Luau for Luau settlements. <clears throat> this led to a further dispersal of the population and doubtless a stronger social integration into the Kenyan nation state. Fifth, the location of Sia, close to the Ugandan border, has provided ample opportunities for local entrepreneurs from the 1940s onwards. Many people from Sia took well-paid seasonal work in Uganda during the 1970s. This changed under the rule of Ida, Idi Amin. The Ugandan economy fared poorly and labor migration was no longer an option for Kenyans. Still, the flow of values across the border did continue, this time through smuggling. The Ugandan shilling was unstable and Kenyan currency was highly valuable in Uganda. Tea, coffee, outboard motors, stereo equipment, and other commodities were sold across the border in large quantities, and people in CI made large profits. This border trade, most of it taking place in boats across Lake Victoria, and much of it illegal, also had consequences for the larger system it was placed in. Among other things, it was said that the smuggling of petrol from Uganda to Kenya in the late 1970s was an important contributing factor to the downward or to the downfall of Ida Amin. Sia is in many t ways typical of the post-colonial world. Geographical and social mobility have increased as his has social differentiation. Ethnic self-conscious has been strengthened due to the increased contact with the outside world. And the patterns of consumption has changed. The boundaries between SIA and the external world are no longer un unambiguous. In a certain sense, Cohen and Udi Humbia. Right. Sorry. God, bear with me with this book. I'm sorry about that, guys. SIA exists with Nairobi, too. While aspects of Kenya and the wider world exist in SIA, Sia is what we call a trans locality. The uh, oh, 
sorry about that. The in, indigenization of modern modernity. Ugh. Sorry. The encounter with global forces of modernity is worldwide irreversible and ongoing. Some have argued that processes and modernization leave few opportunities for local communities to choose their own direction of change. Doubtless, contact between traditional peoples and industrial society has frequently entailed some dramatic and frequently painful aspects. Historically, the encounter between traditional and modern societies has often taken the taken place in the context of colonialism and large-scale massacres of military weaker groups are part of this history. On the other hand, one would seriously underestimate the abilities of traditional peoples if they were be to be regarded merely as helpless victims. Of the avalanche of modern modernity, the encounter may take various forms and may conceptualized in several ways. The Trobriand Islanders are often mentioned as traditional people who have succeeded in incorporating elements of modernity, such as general purpose money without losing aspects of traditional culture and social organization, which they see as important. As early as the 1920s, Malinowski wrote an Ar Ar wrote in Argonauts that it would probably be only be a few question of a few years before the Kula trade and the ritual change of yams vanished, as missionaries and traders had already begun to arrive at Kurawina in this time, nearly a century ago, or nearly a century on, it appears that important parts of the Trobrian culture, including the Kula trade and yam exchange, have survived. Although the changes have been formidable, a famous expression of the Trobriander ability to incorporate new phenomena in into pre-existing structures of meaning can be seen in the ethnographic film Trobrian Cricket, Lee and Kildea, which shows that Trobrianders use cricket as a way to, of communicating amenity and comp competition between martyr clans, matri clans, and that they have modified the rules to adapt it to local circumstances. Cricket is thereby used to strengthen traditional clan identity. On the other hand, it is clear that the Trobrian culture is far from unchanged after its colonial encounter. A different kind of reaction to modernization is represented in the so-called cargo cults of Malaysia, Melanesia and Polynesia. Worsley, 1968. See also Wagner, 1981, Robbins, 2004. These millenni millenarian political or religious cults first emerge as a result of increased contact with the outside world. After the First World War, and some are much more recent, they have a double aim, to reestablish traditional authority and to acquire some of the immense wealth of the foreigners, mostly Americans. <clears throat> In this, such movements represent at the ideological level a happy marriage, as it were, between the old and the new. For as Rusins has remarked, indigenous peoples may wish to retain pe important aspects of th their tradition, but they also tend to want modern commodities. Often, it must be added, neither aim is achieved. One famous cargo cult is the John Frum movement in the New Herbreeds, first analyzed by Peter Worsley. At the cultural level, it can be described as a mixture of Christianity, indigenous religion, and consumerism. Many of the members of the movement were nominal Christians, but were disappointed by the modest returns of Christianity, which chiefly offered prayers and songs and with no material consequences. Early in the 1940s, therefore, Tana men began organizing meetings where they 
awaited messages from the prophet John Frum. He was expected to liberate them from the colonial domination of the British, reestablish the outlawed traditional customs, introduce a new currency with a coconut stamp, and ensure abundance of material goods, cargo. Among the magi magical paraphernalia used by the members of the cult was the Bible, which was assumed to have magical properties since it always seemed to accompany the cargo which arrived by ship and plane at the island. The movement was banned and a man suspected of being John Frum was arrested. However, it continued to flourish and celebrated its 50th anniversary at a solemn ceremony on John Frum Day in February 2007. He, how should such millennial malaria, malaria like, movements be understood? Are they merely functional techniques for reestablishing mental balance in periods characterized by uncertainty and turbulence? Worsley does not think so. He rather sees the cult as a rational attempts to reform and adapt traditional society to new circumstances. It may be said, of course, that they do not provide the results called for, but on the other hand, the reasoning of the John Frum movement is as logical as the Zonde Richcraft institution seen within the tech context of local knowledge and experience. The widespread frustration, which is a necessary condition for a millenni mill millenarian movements to arise, is generally based on the discrepancy between culturally defined aims and the available means. People want, for example, prosperity and political self-determination, but have no established methods of, for achieving these goals. There is a locally perceived gap between cultural lifestyles, ideals, and so social reality, which is clearly a result of colonialism and increased contacts between the West and indigenous peoples. In this context, it is often retorted that many peoples actually had shorter life expectations and suffered greater material hardships before colonialism. This is true, but on the other hand, the perce perception of scarcity is greater today since people are taught through school advertising mass media and direction encounters direct encounters to compare themselves with the european or north american middle class way of life although many Mel melanesians are better off in absolute terms today than they were a hundred years ago they may be worse off in relative terms they suffer relative deprivation. Poverty becomes a greater problem the moment wealth is perceived as a definite possibility. Ways of conceptualizing. Sorry, I got to get a drink. And then let me go back to that one section. If I can find it. Okay, here is this one section right here. You can the perspectives of cultural mixing, and then that way you can pause it and read it at your leisure. Okay, and then okay, we are at ways of conceptualizing encounters in the social scientists and sciences. It has been common to regard encounters between rich northern and poor southern societies either in terms of modernization or in terms of imperialism. The former perspective exemplified in the work of the development ec economist, Walt Ro Ro Rostow, I'm sorry if I mispronounced, presupposes a unilineal evolutionary view according to which the poor countries would eventually catch up with the developed world, economic and political, but contact between North and South would then be beneficial since it would lead to the development of Southern countries. 
The other main view, which was influenced by Lenin's and Tretowski's analysis, analysis of imperialism, instead emphasized the ways in which the rich countries exploit the poor ones and that economic and political contact does not lead to the development of the latter, but instead to their under underdevelopment, large state debts, low prices placed on the goods the poor countries sell, mostly raw materials, and the extraction of profits by multinational companies are symptoms of this situation of structural inequality. Thus, the decolonization of the post-war decades did not lead to the true ind independence and emancipation of poor countries. Since they were tied up with a global capitalist system where they were bound to lose at the level of culture, moreover, Writers influenced by the theory of neo-imperialism argued that formerly colonized people became de become dependent on the models and knowledge systems of the former co colonizers. This is the perspective pre predominant in research often called post-colonial, inspired by the works of the links of France Fanon and Edward Said. Anthropological perspectives on this on these processes differ, as we have seen, both from the models of global systems and from the norm, normative judgments of postcolonialism. Although anthropologists may draw insights from the grand theories of development or underdevelopment and are aware of the discrepancies of symbolic power, bemoaned by post-colonial theorists, their main concern has been and is to show local variations in the encounters between different systems of knowledge and cultural practices. Detailed ethnographers, ethnographies describing <clears throat> colonial and post-colonial situations have indicated a need for a more nuanced understanding than that provided by general models of global relationships. Olivia Harris, writing on cultural complexity in Latin America and particularly the Andes, thus has proposed a typolo typology depicting variations in ways in which social encounters between knowledge systems can be conceptualized. First, she describes the model of mixing a creolization sometimes described as syncretism, hybridity, or in Latin America, mestizaje. This model shows how new meanings are generated from the mixing of diverse influences. What Harris sees as problematic about this is that presupposes fixed points of origin for culture, which then mix rather than regarding the creation of meaning in her view more accurately as an ongoing process with no fixed starting point or end point. The second model is the one of colonization, which in the South American and Andean context implies European dominance, exploitation, and violence towards Indians, including the enforced introduction of Christianity and the Spanish language. This model is strongly dualist and somewhat mechanical in its notion of power and, in Harris's view, draws a rather too strict line between European and Indian cultural, ratifying, reifying both in the act. Third, an alternative to the rigid model of colonization implies the attribution of more agency to the colonized <clears throat> and a phrasing of the relationship in terms of borrowing. The tradition remains remain discreet, but Indians elite. Harris refers especially to Incans, Incas and Maya borrow knowledge from the Christians. The fourth model is that of ju juxtaposition, juxtaposition 
or alternative or alter I'm sorry alternation where two radically different knowledge systems are both accepted without direct attempt at integration since for example Maya and Christian co cosmologies entail fundamentally different conceptualizations of time and of, pa of the past, they could not be mixed, but actors could draw situationally on either. The fifth way of conceptualizing the meaning is that of imitation assimilation or direct identification, whereby persons self-consciously reject their own past and adopt a self-identity and knowledge system they perceive as better or more beneficial to themselves. A conversation from Indian to Mestizo identity in the Andes Harris notes usually involves wholesale rejection of Indian identity in favor of the and identification with what is seen as white or Hispanic. The sixth and final mode discussed by Harris is that the of innovation of creativity and creativity where attention is firmly removed from contrasted knowledge systems and priority is given to autonomy and independent agency. Unlike the five of other models sketched, this kind of conceptualization does not focus on origins. If we look at the at Pacific cargo cults in relation to this typology, it becomes clear that several of the models may generate some understanding of them and that and they are not mutually exclusive in his classic study. Worsley, 1968, emphasized at the unequal power entailed by colonialism. The second model, the creativity of the Melanesians in coping with the new circumstances, the sixth model, and their self-conscious borrowing of cultural traits such as the Bible from the Europeans without altering their basic cultural identity. The fourth model, modernity and the body. Medical anthropology is a growing sub-discipline dealing with cultural knowledge and practices about the body, health, and illness. Commonly, meta medical anthropologists distinguish between three bodies, the personal, the social, and the political, Shepard, Hughes, and Locke. See also Singer and Bear, all of which are socially constructed, although the body, of course, does, an, does in an important sense exist biologically, it is imbued with cultural meanings. Many medical anthropologists have con concentrated their have concentrated their attention on the empirical relationship between Western medicine and indigenous med medical systems. Although there has been a tendency to polemize against Western medicine rather than studying it as a cultural system. Along with the cultural perspectives on health and disease, the most common perspective among medical anthropologists is probably expressed in Harris's fourth model, which indicates the presence of two or, or several mutually exclusive knowledge systems which remain discrete. At mentioned in the last chapter, Mauritians who have who suffer from some ailment draw pragmatically on the services of medical personnel who relate to radically different and frequently contradictory notions about health, illness, and treatment. The Western medical system recognizes a distinction between body and mind, for example, which is not deemed relevant within the Indian Ayurvedic school. In European societies, it is also clear that many inhabitants, <clears throat> immigrants, as well as natives relate to distinct knowledge systems pragmatically when force faced with a practical problem such as a disease without trying to mix them cogn cognitively or in practice 
a different model, which could perhaps be classified as creolization model, in Harris's scheme is represented by Robert Welsh's work among the Nungarium of the New Guinea Highlands. The Nungarium are described as a very traditional people who nevertheless have accepted Western medicine without much ado about and integrated it into their pre-existing system of knowledge. Traditionally, the Ningrium had a wide repertoire of treatments for different ailments. Some complaints could be cured by anyone, while others could be treated by specialists. Since 1963, the Ningrium have had access to a, a dispensary staffed by nurses drawing on... Sorry a Western medical system for diagnosis and treatment. The introduction of new knowledge and new skills was easily accepted and actively appropriated by the Niger, the Ningrium, and moreover, it did not seem to alter their traditional practices, which coexisted happily with the Western medical system. Two main factors account for the, this painless appropriation of new knowledge. First, the Ningrium nurses were trained to staff the dispensary, so it was not run by outsiders for very long. Second, the new medical practices did not inf interfere with the indigenous knowledge system, which contrary to Western medicine, held that the cause of, causes of disease were always external to the body, spirits of goat and ghosts, bad food, etc. Treatment, in their view, would either stop the external agent or strengthen the body. To the extent that the injection and pills offered by the dispensary had positive effects on the disease, they were easily accepted along with the other kinds of treatments and the Ningrium had at their disposal. The lesson from this example may be that meaning is use. To the Ningrium, it made little difference that Western medicine presupposed a cosmology and knowledge system quite distinct from their own. As long as the treatment functions satisfactorily, on the other hand, it could be argued that the assimilation of the alien knowledge might be more difficult if Ningrium were to become medical doctors. If so, cosmologies and not merely the practices would be confronted directly, medical anthropology and the anthropology of the body in a wider sense has a considerable potential for dealing with several classic anthropological problems in several ways. It can shed important light on cultural dynamics in polythenic societies, not least among immigrants in rich countries, as the New Guinea example showed. It can give fresh perspectives on questions of relativism, including those in relation to the develop to development issues and structural violence. And moreover, medical anthropological research is at the forefront of class cultural research on concepts of personhood. We can we now turn to considering an encounter between cultural lo logics and in the context of a development project, the following case adds to the complexity of cultural encounters and additionally shows the importance of understanding culture and society when attempts are made to implement change through aid or development programs. An anthropological, sorry, anthropological, um, let me get a sip guys. Sorry about that. Okay. An anthropological perspective on development. Because of the methodological cultural relativism of the subject, it, it is difficult for anthropologists to see much intellectual value in concept of development, which defines, oh. defines it, for example, as GDP per capita. Analytically, this kind of model is evolutionist and reductionist since both ranks societies on an ethnic ethnocentrically 
defined ladder and disregards local culturally specific value judgments among cattle nomads in East Africa. It may not be rational to produce as many animals as possible, slaughter them and make the make as big profit as one can. For several of these groups, it is more highly valued to have a large herd than to have much money. Cattle with unusually large horns may have a special ritual value, and cattle are indispensable as bride wealth. The cultural relativism inherent in anthropological methodology does not necessarily mean that anthropology anthropologists will by default will be critical of development projects it does imply however that an awareness of social and cultural variation is necessary for such projects to be meaningful we have to take into account the fact that notions of quality of life progress and development are locally constructed the role of anthropologists in development pro projects has therefore tended to consist of providing a local context for the projects, explaining to other to the other professions involved, engineers, economists, and others, what is unique about the, the locality in question. A project in Ecuador, supported by the World Bank and led by the Ecuadorian Ministry, of agriculture attempted to modernize and rationalize the prod production of guinea pigs in the rural highlands, Arquette, 1997. Guinea pigs had been raised and eaten for centuries, and it was held that an improvement of the techniques for production might improve the standard of living of the producers. The program nevertheless failed at an early stage, and an anthropologist, Eduardo Arquetti, was hired to explore what had gone wrong. Traditionally, guinea pigs were kept inside the local people's huts, more specifically in the kitchen. The feeding of the animals was unsystematic. There was a widespread interbreeding, and it was difficult to avoid the spread of disease. The development agent suggests suggested that the that cages be built so that the guinea pigs could be separated by gender fed regularly and mated in such a ways that degeneration could be avoided in the beginning the breeders were to receive the technical equipment free of charge nonetheless every very few villagers accepted the offer the Ecuadorian Ministry of Agriculture was disappointed. Architecti, Arc, yeah, Arca, Arcati quickly discovered that guinea pigs were not just perceived as any kind of food. They were a special kind of food, simultaneously pets and edible food animals. They had an important symbolic place in the lives of the villagers. Guinea pigs were not just eat were not eaten at regular meals, but only at special occasions, such as rites of passage, religious feats, and in connection with healing. The guinea pig had special qualities and may in this regard be compared to the pangolian among the lele. It was also seen as an oracle which could divine the weather and interpret social events. For this reason, it was important to have one's guinea pigs nearby. Animals which were mildly disfigured, for example, because they had an extra toe, possibly as a result of in inbreeding, were considered unusually wise creatures. In addition, it was a fact that the new method of production entailed a considerable extra burden for the already overworked Kuicho woman. To the women, it was thus not rational to change their techniques of production since the proposed changes ran contrary to established local values. Are European and North Americans more rational in the Kiwicha women? Analytically speaking, hardly. As Sahilans has pointed out in critical 
critique of utilitarianism. North Americans consider themselves rational, but they rarely eat cats and dogs and horses. Each would be a sensible thing to do from a nutritional perspective. The point is not whether, not therefore whether this or that person is rational or not, but rather that they are. there are different culturally determined ways of delineating rationality or common sense. Is anthropology inherently conservative? Upon completing his study of humans and guinea pigs, Arcati did not draw the simple conclusion that cultures must be left alone or that any attempt at tampering with long established cultural view values is either doomed to fail or is an expression of evil cultural imperialism. However, and this is his point, if such attempts are to be successful, it is essential that the actors themselves must agree that the proposed changes serve their interests. Those interests, our aims may of course change, but at this stage, he concludes it is necessary to try to understand the guinea pig in its social and symbolic total totality. Regarding questions of development and cultural change, anthropology may be regarded as an inherently conservative discipline. The reason is that both social and cultural anthropology have always, when emphasized the study and study of emphasized the study of interrelationship and sociocultural wholes, and two insisted on an attitude of cultural relativism, according to which any society or culture can. When all is said and done, only be understood in its own terms. From such a vantage point, it seems only natural that changes instigated from the outside are potentially destructive. This attitude is altering within the anthropological community for what really are the own terms of a society of women if women and men, young and old, urbanites and fam farmers in the same community disagree about the direction of change. In the study of guinea pig breeding, Arquetti points out that there is not just one Ecuadorian ideology about guinea pigs, but several and the, the conflict between the Ministry of Agriculture and the rural women might well be understood as a conflict within Ecuadorian society. As a consequence, it becomes absolutely necessary to admit that societies or cultures are neither tightly integrated nor, nor unchanging and closed systems. They change and interact with the outside world. Nevertheless, no matter how global the influences from the outside may be, the responses are always local. And we have seen several examples of local ways and of handling imposed changes from the outside world. See also chapter 19. Change in the cultural complexity also present peculiar method, me methodological challenges to anthropology. Some of these problems are today part and parcel of many, if not most, anthropological research projects. This added complexity does not mean that earlier work has become obsolete but rather that it must be supplemented by new perspectives in both theory and methodology. Decolonizing the anthropological mind. With anthropological studies of minorities, labor migration, urbanization, development issues, and sociocultural cultural processes in the context of nation states and complex societies, it may seem as though anthropology is on its way home. The discipline began as the study of the other. It now increasingly includes the study of ourselves, or to put it more accurately, the boundaries between us and them are becoming blurred. Today, anthropological research is increasingly becoming available to its objects as they acquire literacy and uh, as 
excuse me, an educated middle class capable of reading anthropological studies develop. This forces researchers to take their object, objects of study seriously in ways which, we, which were formerly unnecessary. The, this development has also led to a growing understanding of the peculiar historical and ideological circumstances which led to the growth of anthropology, perhaps particularly in Europe. There are the discipl discipline entered there the discipline entered new domains along the French and British colonial expansion. The anthropologist, in the view of many, was an accomplice of colonialism and professional interest developed in the subject on both sides of the excuse me of the Atlantic may be seen to reflect domestic concerns at least as much as it reflects the concerns of, of, of the other. Marcus and Fisher, 1986. Anthropologists also contribute to the making of history. Their perspectives and interpretations contribute to defining the world in a particular way. There are therefore several governments in the third world which tend to deny access to the anthropological field workers, not only because the anthropological emphasis on cultural variation is at odds with their development strategies, but also because they see it as their own right to write their own contemporary history. By no means, every government in the developing world is con content with depictions of their country insisting on the existence of headhunters, gift economies, traditional oral religions, and or unique initiation rites, rituals among their citizens. In his famous book, The Orientalism, the literary scholar Edward said, criticized classic European philo philological and historical scholarship about Asia prop Asia for propagating an image of the Orient as mystical and tantalizing, but profoundly irrational. If the history of the Orient were to be written by Orientals themselves, the result would be quite different. Not, the, not least because we speak of an area stretching, I'm sorry, stretching, oh, sorry, not the least because we speak of an area stretching at least from Turkey to Japan. Said argues that the Western researchers have reproduced stereotypes of the Oriental in their production of myths about themselves, about the Western world as the cradle of progress, rationally, rationality, and science. The Bulgarian French intellectual <clears throat> Chekhovkin Todorov has demonstrated in a similar vein how French descriptions of primitives have for centuries closely followed domestic discourse about politics and social philosophy. And he intimate, intimate, he intimates, huh, pardon me, and he intimates, intimates, doesn't make any sense, that they all that they indeed tell us more about France than about the other. The, this kind of criticism is taken very seriously by anthropologists, yet, as Jean-Claude Gallet argues, Orientalism and anthropology may have shared origins, but they have developed quite distinct methods and ways of conceptualizing society and culture. Generally speaking, Orientalism, in said sense, may nevertheless be seen as a fundamental mode of misrepresenting others, to which anthropologists are no less prone than other commenters, commentators. As regards to India in particular, Ronald Indian, Indian writing from within Orientalism, has documented in great detail how conceptualizing conceptualization of Indian society and culture have owed more to European 
preoccupations than to Indian society itself. Bina Das similarly argues that India cannot be represented by foreign scholars as if the country itself were silent. Unlike the predecessors, she says, contemporary social scientists cannot lay claims to absolute truths, but can only insert their voices within plurality of voices in which all kinds of statements prescriptive Oh. Normative, descriptive, indic indicative are waging virtual battles, battle about the nature of Indian society and legitimate space for social sciences in this society. To be fair, it should be added that many metropolitan anthropologists have in recent years begun to study native history from an insider's perspective in his pathbreaking Europe and the people without history. Eric Wolf writes the history of the great discoveries from the perspective of the discovered peoples and in island and in islands of history Sahelans. Compares Polynesian oral versions of history with written versions drawn up by foreigners, showing how they are all cultural interpretations of the same events and that the foreign histories are not necessarily more correct than the native ones, Levi Strauss, <clears throat> in line with this mode of reasoning, earlier argued that history writing is a myth, is the myth of our time, because, because it, like oral myths, is based on ideological interpretation of a very limited set of facts from the past. History writing, he argued, in what was originally a polemic against Jean-Paul Sartre's ethnocentric views is not a product of the past, but is rather created by the needs perceived by those who write history. An analogous statement could be made about anthropology. It is nor created by the other, but by the interaction between anthropologist and the other. A consequence of pr processes of modernization and decolonization in the core areas of anthropology is the fact that our informants not only increasingly demand to be consulted on the con content of our studies of them, but some of them also begin writing their own theoretical texts about their culture, history, and society. This decentralization, and some would say decolonization, of the discipline, although admittedly still modest, has led to new challenges for anthropologists in bringing us closer to our objects of study and, in some cases, engaging in theoretical dialogue with them. Another field of the study partly turns, to, turns the problematic of Orientalism on its head, looking instead, and I will come back to this section right here guys instead at non-western images of the west sometimes called occidentalism notwithstanding the obvious power discrepancies these ideas tend to be no less stereotypical than simplistic than western notions of the rest there exists an enormous anthropological social sociological and philosophical literature about modernity and modern societies because of its attention to meticulous fieldwork and because of its orientation towards non-european societies anthropology has contributed more contributed important insights to the effects of the that modernity and tradition are not mutually exclusive contrary to what max weber and other sociologists of modernity believed modern politics wage work and a modern state may well exist side by side with ancestral cults and a lineage organization although they are there are bound to be tensions and contradictions within such complex societies it has also been shown that people who live in modern societies can retain important traditional characteristics 
such as, for example, neopatism and moral particularism, social cohesion at the community level, and a wide range of religious beliefs ranging from virgin birth to sorcery. At the same time, there is no doubt that modernization entails a in for irreversible social and cultural change. One seemingly paradoxical results of modernization in many parts of the world is the emergence of traditionalist movements praising the virtue of what they believe to be the ancestral culture like cargo cults. Such movements may be understood as strategies to come to terms with new social and cultural circumstances adapting to the new without letting go of old of the old entirely and thereby creating a sense of continuity with the past in a rapidly changing world. In the following two chapters, we look into some such movements and processes in some detail. Here is the section of South Africa and the anthropologist, so you can see this. That should. There you go. So you can pause and read that at your leisure. And this is the end of chapter 16. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, chapter 16. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it.